from the Soul Food Studios in the crap part of Richmond. It's the Ghost Night Season podcast. We're back. Indeed we are. And as Devo would say... We have a pack show. Because we've been away for so long. Where were you people? I mean, seriously. It's been 13 days. My gosh. Well, that does mean a packed show. Checking the old soul food answering machine, it looks like we do have at least one of our PT actors who's uh, doing what actors do and phoning it in. We've got a bit of poetry, this one about a backstage romance. We're going to dip into politics, don't worry, that'll be fun. And our man at the movies, our cinema correspondent, our friend at the festivals, will be reporting live from Jeff. And who knows? Maybe there'll be time for a little football, which returns to live action tomorrow, Saturday, May 16th. Bundesliga! Okay, it's not Premier League, but it'll do under the circumstances. Brushing up my German, breaking out the Newcastle brown ale, popping down to Steveston to pick up my sweets and crisps, and maybe even a pie. But, I mean, the empire is built on pies. And to finish off... Because tonight would have been the opening night of our season closer, not to be confused with the closing night of our season opener, which happened already. October 5th, I remember it well. Yes, on October 5th, when Pacific Theatre closed the Canadian premiere of Mother of the Maid. That's already happened. But I think it's equally important to remember what hasn't already happened, or to be more precise, what hasn't happened that was supposed to happen, but hasn't. Attention! Attention must be paid! So we're going to hear a couple of familiar voices on a Greyhound bus, taking us at least the first mile or two on a trip to Bountiful. The trip to Bountiful. Bottom line, though, we've got ourselves quite a backlog here tonight. Mostly because I've been so darn lazy, but uh, I mean, also, look, uh, stuff's happening, you know, important stuff. So we got quite the backlog of tunes, new tunes, because what do you think songwriters are going to do in lockdown? Same thing they did when they were 15 years old, strumming guitars in their bedrooms. I mean, this social isolation stuff is mother's milk to these people, the water they swim in. You got a pandemic, bring it on. What songwriter's going to do? Songwriter's going to songwrite. What musician's going to do? Musician's going to music. This came in over the Soul Food transom just this morning. From Soul Food's resident string plucker, Mr. Spencer Capier. Sweet gift of a woman. 
should also mention that uh, apparently the composer, Mr. Capier, brought in a chick singer to back him up on that tune, and I guess she made up some words and stuff, and Spencer was good enough to let her uh, add him to the song. Girl name of Carol Aaron, Aaron's, Carol and Carol and Aaron's. I see potential there. Kid could go places. Thanks, Spencer, for helping out the emerging talent. Tell me over and over and over again, my friend I you don't believe we're on the eve of destruction It's time to come clean To admit my shameful secret I seem like a reasonably well-adjusted guy Certainly no paranoid nutcase But I am a child of the Cold War. I walked home from grade one at Colonel Irvin's school in Calgary under the shadow of a great gray pole, at the top of which was an air raid siren. We did practice lining up and filing to the gym in case, well, in case the Russians attacked. In case, you know, the end of the world. So my... uh, Awkward admission, I'm a prepper, a hoarder. I don't mean I bought a truck full of toilet paper six weeks ago. I mean that over the years I've been stockpiling essentials for survival in case of, well, in case of whatever. In my attic and in a special storage unit I had built onto the end of my house, And in a hallway that I converted into more storage, you'll find rows and rows of shelves containing all the things my family could need to weather an extended crisis like the one we're in the middle of right now. Books. I have my books And my poetry to protect me There's one special section that's essentially a preparedness research library. The Last Man on Earth, an excellent anthology by Azak Asimov. No Blade of Grass, Day of the Triffids, I Am Legend, Alas Babylon, Canticle for Leibowitz, Earth Abides, On the Beach, Folk of the Fringe, The Postman, On the Beach, oh, I said that already, A Boy and His Dog, Children of Men, Ridley Walker, The Road, Station Eleven, The Top 10,000 of All Time, Remnant. But that's not all. Board games, 
CDs, records, cassettes, mini discs, and especially movies. Lots and lots and lots of DVDs, even VHS tapes. I am a rock. I am an island. So when what happened happened, I was ready for it. A friend told me recently, the people who are least affected by social isolation, men over 55. Now that could be because we have entered a grumpy old men years, and I won't argue that. But I have another theory. We are the bomb shelter kids. The little boys who grew up imagining the end of the world and what we would have to do to survive. I remember a game from my childhood where I pretended everybody else had disappeared and I was the last person alive on the earth. It would be on a day when everybody else was inside, like a rainy day or after the other kids' bedtimes, or or maybe there was some big event that everybody was inside watching on TV or something like a moon landing or somebody's assassination or Batman or something. But as a kid, I'd pretend they were all gone forever, destroyed by some nuclear war or triffids or whatever, and I was left all alone on the planet Earth to try and survive by my wits. And then the game would go on for a bit too long. The game would start seeming a bit too real. And I'd start thinking maybe there really had been a nuclear war in Russia or somewhere, and that's what everybody was in watching on TV. Pretty soon the radiation would get to Calgary and everybody'd be dead. And I'd catch myself not breathing because that wasn't impossible enough. Even a kid knew that. That was something that could actually be. Something that was too likely and too frightening to make into a game. Hence, the stockpiling. And it has stood me in good stead, I'll tell you. What do you do when the world ends? You do whatever you always most wanted to do. So I started a radio show. I would have started a theater company, but you need other people to do that, and money, and maybe even audience, and I've already done that. So, radio show. So, vocationally at least, I'm all set. But personally, on the home front, well, Carol and I could not come up with a movie to watch together to save our lives, to save our sanity. The things I came up with, we bailed after a few minutes, or eventually with one look at the cover. Too dark, too sad, too slow, too serious. We get enough of that. But I was not to be deterred. Movies matter. So I scanned my libraries of movies. Yes, libraries, plural. There are the ones in the living room uh, underneath the TV screen uh, and also the ones in the living room in the sort of stand where we have the lamp. And there's my top 250 in my study. And on the other side of my study, a few shelves of movies I want to watch next or rewatch because maybe they should be in my top 50, but I forget exactly. And uh, the ones in the storage, you get the picture. Ready for the apocalypse. So I gathered up a short list of 50 or 60 or 70 movies specially curated for... The Cheerful International Film Festival. Comedies, romances, adventure flicks, a few kids' movies, gotta have babe, maybe even risk a few tears with E.T. And the critics all agree. Both agree. It's a success. We opened the festival with a couple of my wife's choices, Joe vs. the Volcano, which was perfection, Tom Hanks practicing a little social isolation out at sea, And what about Bob, the magnificent babe, and something from the ever-popular Chiff short feature sidebar. Porridge today, Gromit. But for this viewer, the film that really struck home to this viewer 
seemed just very timely, at least for this viewer. It's been tugging at me since I played a little clip back in episode three, Singing in the Rain. Believe it or not, I had never seen it, though dozens of people, hundreds of people have recommended it to me. But that song just stuck in my head. Good morning. Good morning. We've talked the whole night through. Good morning. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. And what could lift a person's spirits more than that? I mean, it's practically the theme song for the Cheerful International Film Festival, The Chiff. There's our motto, separating the wheat from the chiff. Okay, maybe not. And oh my gosh, that movie, Singing in the Rain, what a treat that was. Well, well, Mr. Simpson, we're really rolling. Yeah, well, you can stop rolling at once. Huh? Don, lean it. All right, everybody, save it! Save it, tell them to go home. We're shutting down for a few weeks. What? Well, don't just stand there, tell them. Everybody go home until further notice. I'm singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. What a glorious feeling, I'm happy again. If we bring a little joy into your humdrum life, it makes us feel as though our hard work ain't been in vain for nothing. As a matter of fact, the grand jury of the Soul Food Ghost Light Season 2020 Cheerful International Film Festival have declared that movie the official film of the 2020 Film Festival. You were right, all hundreds of you, everyone that recommended it, that flick goes straight to my top 250 shelf right between Silence of the Lambs and Sling Blade, which were not candidates for the Cheerful International Film Festival. Okay, so what's up next at Chiff? Well, who knows? Sky's the limit. Unlike most film festivals, we don't need a schedule. Whatever strikes our fancy when we decide to settle in for some popcorn. Maybe weekly screenings of Singing in the Rain. Who's going to stop us? We are prepared for a good long time. I built walls A fortress deep and mighty That none may penetrate Thanks, Paul. Artie. Yeah, we're on a first name basis. Simon and Garfunkel personal friends of mine. Okay, but uh, that's enough with the old tunes. How about something brand new from Soul Food Regular and personal friend of mine, Mr. Garth Brooks. Oh, sorry, I'll read that again. Personal friend of mine, Mr. Garth Bowen. Some day the mountains may crumble and fall and someday the insects may grow to be tall and someday the forest may wither and die Your love for me never will run dry. Someday the oceans may cover the land, and someday the buildings may all turn to sand. Someday the rivers may not be so pure But your love for me forever will endure Someday the soldier 
may be without fault Someday the mighty may be brought low Someday the hunted may lie down in peace To love for me never will see that. Wow, beautiful. Good words to keep in mind these days. Someday. That's actually not an entirely new song. Garth wrote that in 1996, but he only recorded it last year, just in time for the pandemic, when we need to be reminded what the Bard of West Richmond has to say. And that's got a brand new video that Garth put together with his wife, Tricia Yearwood, I'm sorry, I'll read that again. A brand new video that Garth put together with his wife, Barb Bowen. Touching video because it's so personal. It was posted April 30th on their Facebook pages, Garth Oliver Bowen, or Barb Bowen. Tasty organ track by Brett Ziegler. Bee Gees by Leslie Hagen. Personal friends of mine. You can download that tune and the rest of his nearly new album, What There Is, at Garth Bowen. Dot com. You know, we played you COVID Wars, a brand new tune from Garth on an early episode of Ghost Light Season, and it has 1.7 thousand views on Barb's Facebook page. I'm not kidding. And Barb's only got 520 friends at her house right now. 
uh, no, no, really, on Facebook, she's got 520 friends. So either every one of them has listened 3.26923076 times, or that thing has gone well beyond her Facebook page. Garth's COVID song has gone viral. Can we even say that anymore? <laughs> you know, Vanity Fair sent me an email. Can jeans make coronavirus more deadly? Man, I hope not. I don't want to have to wear dress pants all the time. If you're feeling sad and lonely, there's a service I can render. Tell the one who loves you only, I can be so warm and tender. Call me. Okay, it's time for our regular feature here on Soul Food, the ghost light season, with Pacific Theater actors doing what they do best, phoning it in. When it seems your friends desert you, there's somebody thinking of you. I'm the one who never hurt you. Maybe that's because I love you. Call me. Don't be afraid, you can call me. So we'll just fire up that Soul Food answering machine. And see what we've got here. Hi, uh, this is Soul Food Studios International. Sorry I can't take your call right now. Please leave your name and message after the beep. I'll call you back. Just uh, stepping into the shower for a couple minutes here. You have three messages. One new message. Message one. Hey Ron, Jalen here. Thought I'd let you know that I had a dream last night that I was in a Christmas carol with you. And yes, it's a one-man show, but I guess I just decided I was uh, subconsciously meant to be in it. And uh, you decided that you were going to leave at the very beginning of the second act. So you tapped me on the head to let me know that I was now on my own. And then I forgot all my lines and I had to improvise how the show ended. And the second act turned out to only be five minutes long, but it definitely ended with, God bless us, everyone. And so, you know, I think I nailed it. Well, I'd say you did. But you know, Jalen, you are one of the few people I can think of who would not get all that freaked out by the actor's nightmare. Oh no, I have to improvise? Don't throw me in that briar patch. End of messages. Well, my telephone number is Cherry, I ain't one too. Yes, my telephone number is Cherry, I ain't one too. So come on over, baby, when you're lonesome. And I do want to say that number is not the official Soul Food Studios number, so uh, probably better not to call it. That was Big Joe Turner. I call him Big. First name basis. Hey, Big. And he just says, hey, Ron. Personal friend of mine. He kind of wanted to contribute something to the show, and I like to give these young kids a break. So Big Joe Turner. You're going to hear a lot from that kid in the future. He's going to be big. I mentioned earlier that I have my books and my poetry to protect me, so let's take refuge for a moment in the poetic arts. Here's our bard in residence, Diane Tucker, the poet laureate of our ghost light season, with The Star, a story of star-crossed backstage romance. The Star Backstage hallway, late I waited for my chorus boy romance His brown arms The silence after a show is a black silence, a threat that spreads like oil. 
into my weight wandered the star, a man too beautiful to risk even looking at. He stood in front of me, looked into the boy's dressing room, back at me. In his caressing baritone, he said something like, it's hard to wait, it's hard to love. Then he kissed my cheek. Tenderly, I thought then, now I think with pity too. Years later, the star died of what his parents insisted was pneumonia. I wish I'd grabbed him those years ago and held on, answered his pity with pity. Admitted our beauty couldn't save us from that silent hallway, from its long emptiness. The Star by Diane Tucker. Music by Michael Hart from his album All the Things I Feel But Didn't Know How to Say. The song is Rainy Day Blues. The Star is published in the spring issue of The Maynard. HTTPS colon slash slash the Maynard dot org slash volume 13 number one slash index dot PHP copyright 2020 by Diane Tucker recording offered in agreement with The Maynard M-A-Y-N-A-R-D. Contractual Obligations Department Legal Division Soul Food Audio Enterprises International. Well, kids, this episode was supposed to have gone out last week and then (laughs) earlier this week, and then, well, now it's now. So it's too late to tell you that Thursday evening there is going to be, there was going to be, a special concert by the Quirks that you could stream on their Facebook page. Oh, well... Maybe we'll catch up one of these days. Maybe there'll be like, I don't know, a pandemic so everything slows down and we can get around to all the things we really want to do. But we're not too late to listen to a brand new tune from Laura that she recorded for a compilation album produced by Yellow House Studio that was released just this week. The record is Artists in Isolation. The song is Sailor.
things These sails are full and wide I feel a salty shift and change in the sky Just like the tide This ancient ship that carries me She heaves the deepest sigh She feels the shifting with a curious eye Oh, this sea is wide And when the water rises, well, I rise to meet it Tonight was to have been the opening night of the last show in Pacific Theater's 35th season, Horton Foote's mid-century masterpiece, The Trip to Bountiful. It's a play I've wanted to do for most of those 35 years. Soon after our first baby was born, who now has little ones of her own, my mom came out from Calgary to meet little Thea Kristen and One night she was brave or foolhardy or self-sacrificing enough to look after the little critter all on her own. I guess she'd done that sort of thing before, so that Carol and I could go see a movie. Now, back in CalArts days, before that, I had slipped off to Westwood one afternoon with my buddy J.P. Allen to see a matinee. And maybe because J.P. was a Texan, or maybe because we just got lucky, or probably because it had Robert Duvall in it, we slipped into a cool, air-conditioned California movie house and watched Tender Mercies, written by Horton Foote. And I wept. And that was okay with my pal J.P. And Tender Mercies became my favorite film. And J.P. one of my favorite friends. Both things are still true. Not so many miles between Texas, where Horton and J.P. grew up, and Alberta, where I grew up. So when Carol and I went out to see our first movie since the new baby had come along, we went to see the latest from Mr. Foote, The Trip to Bountiful. And again, I wept. For all the same reasons as Tender Mercy, but also because... It's about a resilient prairie woman and her son and coming home to the place where she raised him. I've tried to get Trip to Bountiful into several Pacific theater seasons, but I could never make it work out right. I had this vision of Erla Faye Forsyth as Carrie Watts and Kyle Jesperson as her soft-spoken son. And I had some pictures in my mind of how it could be staged and I knew Carolyn Rapanos would take that idea and make poetry out of it. And finally this season, it was time. So I added Paige Lauter and Caitlin Williams, and Stephen L. Cheshin and Richard Mean and Jade Munsey to the cast, and I invited Kira Fonzie to create and perform the music. Well, as it turns out, we're going to have to wait a bit longer to take that trip to Bountiful but I've already waited a few decades. 
Another year or two ain't going to matter much. Still, I didn't want tonight to pass by without something. So I asked Erla and Paige to bring us a couple moments from the play and Kira to sing us through them. So why don't you settle back into your seat on the Greyhound, headed out from Houston, Texas, to a little bus station in Harrison. It's only a stone's throw from Bountiful. And listen in to the two women talking quietly in the seats behind you, in the middle of a Texas night. It'll be funny living at home again. We've been married a year. My husband was anxious for me to go. He said he'd worry about my being alone. I'm the only child and my parents and I are very close. My father being in the oil business, we moved around a lot. I guess I went to school in 15 different towns along the coast. I guess moving around like that made me and my mother and father even closer. I hoped so that my mother and daddy would like my husband and he'd like them. I needn't have worried. They hit it off from the very first. Mother and daddy say they feel like they have two children now, a son and a daughter. His name's Robert. I guess any name he had I would think was nice. I love my husband very much. Lots of girls I know think I'm silly about him, but I can't help it. Did Ludy mention my heart condition? He worries about it, so <laughs> I hated to leave him. Well, I hope he'll forgive me in time. So many people are nervous today. Ludy wasn't nervous back in Bountiful. Neither was I. The breeze from the Gulf would always quiet your nerves. You could sit on your front gallery and smell the ocean blowing in around you. I regret the day I left, but I thought it was the best thing at the time. Farming was so hard to make a living by, and I had to see to the farm myself. Our house was old, and there was no money to fix it with, nor send Ludie to school. So I sold off the land and gave Ludie an education. Callie said I could always come back and visit her. <laughs> she meant it, too. That's who I'm going to stay with now, Callie Davis. I get a card from her every Christmas. I wrote her last week and told her to expect me. Told her not to answer, though, on account of Jessie May opens all my mail. I didn't want her to know I was going. She'd try to stop me. Jessie May hates me. I don't know why, but she hates me. For you and for me. Hate me or not, I gotta get back and smell that salt air and work that dirt. I'm gonna spend the whole first month of my visit working in Callie's garden. I haven't had my hands in dirt in 20 years. <laughs> my hands feel the need of dirt. Do you like to work the ground? Try it sometimes. It'll do wonders for you. I bet I'll live to be a hundred once I can get outside again. It was being cooped up in those two rooms. It was killing me. I used to work the land like a man. Had to when Papa died. 
I got two little babies buried there, Renee Sue and Douglas. Diphtheria got Renee Sue. I never knew what carried Douglas away. He was just weak from the start. I know Callie's kept their graves weeded. Oh, if my heart just holds out until I get there.